I started reading Game of Thrones, the books, A Song of Ice and Fire, basically during the time of my divorce. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember it struck me, I was in a hotel room. When you get divorced, often involves hotel rooms. <laughs> and I was in a hotel room and I, I'd totally forgotten about the TV show and the books. It just wasn't on my mind. And, you know, I was in a hotel room and packing or unpacking or something and turned on the TV. What was it about? And there was Game of Thrones. So I would guess that was when season three came out or season, yeah, something like and that. And what country were you in? I mean, that's, that's, this, no, this that in. is even harder to say. I was probably in Hong Kong, which is not really a country at all, <laughs> <laughs> truth be told. But, um, and it just occurred to me, I thought, oh, now that I'm divorced, I, I could take the time to actually read these books, which I'd never considered an option before. Um, yeah, you may also, you may suddenly have a lot more time in your hands if you're divorced. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and now here I am with my, my girlfriend like five years later mm -hmm. she's off camera none of you can see how good looking she is hi <laughs> <laughs> and she's catching up with me in the Game of Thrones books so I think for years it has been on my mind to make a video trying to talk honestly about bad writing in the A Song of Ice and Fire books in George R. R. Martin's work and it, I can't really say it's a taboo subject. It's something pretty much every podcast at some point breaks out in guffaws about, right? So, Melissa, you're not 100% up to the way. All right, let's let's start at mm -hmm. the deep end. Yeah, I was, yeah. No, no. I, okay. I was going to mention some some shallow shallow. I want to start with a really with a really deep one because she's far enough in the books to do this too. Okay. Okay. Who paid the cat's paw? Which is to say. Who gave the dagger so that Bran would be assassinated when he was crippled, and why? So, uh, background here. Still to this day, people show up at conferences at where George R. R. Martin is speaking, and they say things like, you know, slight variation words, oh, I hope in the next book we'll finally get the solution to the cat's paw mystery. Yeah. To who? And George R. R. Martin says back, oh, I, I thought that already was solved. <laughs> Really? That already was resolved in the Well, books. maybe it's because Tyrion believed it was Joffrey that ordered somebody to do that. Right. Joffrey had access to because it's made of um, right Valyrian steel. Valyrian steel. Yeah, right. So, but even common... Tyrion's account of it, there are so many holes. There are so many things lacking. There's so many. There are so many things about it that don't make sense. Yeah. And this is like the central motivating element or instigating event for the plot for the first three books or something. Right. Right. Yeah. It's oh, basically why? what started the right. the war. I mean, right. So yeah. why was this child assassinated? No reason. Why was he assassinated with a weapon that uniquely links the murderer to Littlefinger mm. in King's Lane? No reason. He just picked that one at random. He just liked the way it looked. Why was the assassin given a weapon that's priceless? Like, in the books, as they progress, we get the sense uh, dragon bone and Valyrian steel. It's like this dagger is as expensive as, like, an army. You know what I mean? It's like, it's so ridiculously uh, valuable. Yeah. But, no, no reason. No. And then, you know, and, and how is this resolved? Uh, you know. Yeah, that's true. That's it. Well, I mean, he I just want to say. He made it up as he went along. You know, that's George R. R. Martin's writing method is gardening as he goes along. Just, you know, the story grows in the telling, you know. Okay. So you it's not a plotted out murder mystery. He didn't, when he started writing the, the mystery, he didn't have the end in mind already. So it just kind of fizzles out. Okay, so yeah. I thought you started out this video by talking about how you were introduced to the books. So yeah. I will just say a little bit. The Game of Thrones cool. show came out structure when, symmetry. Listen, that's going yeah. When I first started college, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, started university, and I, a couple of my friends, I think my sophomore year, would always meet up at this one house, one of my friends' house, mm. to watch Game of Thrones, and I was really like anti Game of Thrones for no real good reason, just because I'm I'm not usually somebody who watches mainstream television. Uh, n n I mean, not saying I'm you know, above that or whatever, but <laughs> uh, it's just usually I'm not, not into that. Whether you're above it or beneath it, you're outside, right? Well, yeah, uh -huh. and I've always had this, um, you know, coming from the background that I have, I know some people who may be listening up to me that don't even know who I am, don't really know my background, but, um, you know, I come from, like, more Christian background, and, like, I always thought yeah. of HBO as this really, like, <laughs> pornographic, you know, like, they... 
I had, I had she's not Christian at all herself now as an adult, but that's interesting in terms of her upbringing. And HBO yeah. is the soft core porn of cable yeah, television. Exactly. Which, yeah, we didn't have HBO. And Game of Thrones yeah. in particular is notorious for a reason this way, right? Yeah, yeah. right. And the um, books are not, eh? I mean, no. like the amount of the amount of on camera sex in the book, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah, 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 it's it's not as raunchy as I thought it would be. Um, I mean, you did mention the other day you wouldn't want to be reading this in front of your parents. Like you wouldn't. Want yeah, to be, right, 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 right. Like right. there are some moments that are like. But a lot, you remember? Yeah. Sorry, the jumping ahead, but jumping back. She was shocked when I pointed out to her in Dunkin' Egg that there, the Dunkin' Egg stories are the prequels to these songs, mm-hmm. that there is an off-camera sex scene that's alluded yeah. to with, like, one sentence. Like, oh, oh, yeah, I would have had you, no you, idea. Was she, was, like, oh. she was shocked. She was like, oh, my, you know. It's like, no. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. She read it. So most of the sex is like that in the books, unlike the TV show, right? Yeah, so yeah. That, that was my first impression of Game of Thrones. I, I thought that it would be, you know, basically boobs and dragons and right. uh, swords and stuff. Uh, there, there are there are boobs in the book. I mean, it has to be said. I yeah. think we all have a pretty good sense of what George's type is. And I don't. I don't think George has a lot of experience with women. I really don't. But anyway, <laughs> this is yeah. another source of bad writing. Is the mm-hmm. the author's li- limited uh, experience like? Yeah, anyway. so much to talk about. Uh, but, yeah. yeah. So there was one of my friends who the George Mort Mar- George R. R. Martin School of Seduction. How to. <laughs> Yeah. So, so one of my friends who who went by the name of Panda, that was his nickname. So Panda was telling me about uh, <laughs> the books. So he right. he started with the show, and then he was like, "Oh, there are books. Like, I'm gonna read all the books." And he was like, really going on to me about how I should start reading them and really get into them. And um, the way he was describing it to me sounded so dorky. I didn't right. usually read. <sighs> he was like, "And there are dragons." Yeah. Like you know the way and there's he this sword it. fight. <laughs> yeah, he's like it's like a hist- like a historical fictional novel, but like all these other things involve yeah. like dragons and right. uh, you know zombies, like these creatures beyond the wall yeah. and stuff. Uh, so yeah, in short, that was not convincing to me to get into the books or the show. So I successfully avoided it. You know, other than right. like people posting right. like. And that, and then like, <laughs> she fell in love with the wrong man. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because you know I I got into your YouTube channel and you like you yeah. posted a video about Game of Thrones and I remember and that, was, that was one of the first kind of non-serious or silly things I had on my channel. Like before I started yeah. doing Game of Thrones and Song of Ice and Fire content, everything was was pretty serious. Yeah, go on, just mention like whether it was politics or talking about my own life or whatever. Right. But yeah, yeah, that that kind of changed the tone. But anyway, go on. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, so on my channel, you then heard me talking about yeah, it. Yeah, I heard you. T- I mean, yeah. I had seen so many other videos mm-hmm. from you beforehand. I was not expecting yeah. that. I was just, you know, you didn't seem like the kind of person that would. I don't know what I thought the kind of person was that right. got into Game of Thrones. You know, kind of like right. dirty, like they go to conventions. Right. Like, right. Okay, so I got to jump do, in here. I got to uh, jump in here. I don't know if she has more to say than that, but I got to jump in here. <laughs> you know, so I heard a podcast recently, and they had new people on the podcast at like a round table. And one of the questions they asked is, who is your favorite character on Game of Thrones? Uh, sorry, sorry, in the books. Song of Ice for whatever. You know, sorry. For, we're talking about the books here. We're not really talking about the TV show at all. Yeah. Who is your favorite character in, in the book series? And you kind of can tell something about the people. And naturally, nobody's going to say, like, nobody's going to say Jon Snow. Nobody's, they all said, you know, pretty obscure characters, like pretty minor characters who did memorable things or something. Right. But I, just the first thing I thought, wow, if that, if that was put to me with no preparation, like if I were a guest on this podcast, my answer would be Kevin Lannister. Mm-hmm. So... Kevin Lannister gets one chapter from his point of view, and you haven't gotten to it yet. It's right at the end. Okay. So, don't worry. Kevin Lannister is the prototypical mean old man talking about politics in the book. Mm-hmm. He's just like, it's that side of the books. But if you ask, you said, what kind of person likes Game of Thrones? Or why would I be the kind of person who likes Game of Thrones? I'm not into dragons. I'm not into zombies. I have other sources of boobs in my life. I'm not reading the books for erotic interest or whatever, right? Yeah. But uh, to me, it's really moving and really interesting and really politically stimulating, including, you know, Kevin Lannister. But Kevin Lannister is, he's like, for all of his, he is just another guy who sits there and talks about and reflects on the political situation. But yeah, all the chapters that are mean old men discussing politics are thrilling to me and like the childhood perspective of bran is of no interest right. none you know uh, uh 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 the various female characters 
you know, teenage girl having her period for the first time. I, that, that was well written, by the way. I mean, I'm not saying that was, but not what I'm here for. You know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah. there's a lot there in terms of the, the range of life experience. But, yeah, in terms of why I'm the kind of person, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm, after I'm in it reading Kevin it, Lannister. you know, I, yeah. I do understand why you got into it. And also, yeah, I read it based on your suggestions. Like, the first book. Is yes, right. A lot of chapters are about the young characters. And you, you just said basically to incredible. skip them. But and babe, did I you, pretty did much you start did. with all three Duncan Egg novels? Or did you just yeah, read I, one or something? That's right. Did you read yeah. all three? Yep, okay. I started yeah. with all three of yeah, the yeah, Duncan yeah, Egg novels. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, this, this, this podcast that is about bad writing in Game of Thrones. I think the Duncan Egg novels are exquisitely well written. I think they're extremely well written. Mm. The very first of the three stories is a little bit subtle in its virtues. Like, I can imagine someone reading it and just seeing, well, what's the big deal? But I do, I do think the first one is also very well written. But then the, the next two, currently there are only three. There's supposed to be like seven more. Uh, but I think that those are really, really well written and are a really good way into the books. And I mean, I, I think you just get the point there honor and dignity matter yep. and visibly and invisibly our obligations in life are linked to politics and trying to make the world a better place and what kind of man do you want to be the the ontic mooring this is real academic speak you know but like the the sub basement level structure of what these books are about philosophically and politically i think is really set out for you there in those short stories and without dragons you know, from a, also, you know what, sir? This is another issue in, in, in the books as a whole is they're not from uh, an aristocratic point of view. I mean, Dunk is not at the top of the social hierarchy. Yes. He's pretty close to the bottom. So you also get a bit more of a peasant's view on this world and on why these uh, these political issues matter. Yeah, yeah. And sorry, but I, I did jump in. Did you want to say a little bit more about, about your first discovery of the books and why you started reading them? Or, or no? Well, yeah, yeah, obviously yeah. I started reading them because you had read them and... <laughs> you uh, you said I should read the Duncan Egg, Duncan Egg yeah. and that, that's what I read yeah. first. And then I started reading the the first book at, at your recommendation. I skipped quite a few of the chapters. She skimmed read. some of the yeah. first volume because right. there's just exactly. a lot there. I mean, like, I might, I might oh, go back okay, and read okay, it. Okay, yeah, okay, I didn't okay, actually okay. have the physical book when but I started look, reading it. So this, like, this is about bad writing, right? Yeah. Okay. But let's be real. This is like what I said with the, the murder mystery. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of crap in the first book that goes nowhere. And that reflects the fact that this was an improv. That's why the first book is only worth saying. When you are reading the first book as it is today, in many ways you're reading a first draft, not just a first book, right? Yeah. Oh, um, what about all the religions that are really important by book five or book seven or whatever you want to say? They're not in there. No mention. No? <laughs> it's like, you know, that, that world building doesn't go on. Yeah. Um, what about the board game called Sivas? What about the literal and figurative Game of Thrones called Sivas that turns up in, like, the very last volume as they're currently extant? Yeah, it's not right? even in Piece of Crows, which yeah, I'm reading right now. Yeah, it's not in Piece yeah. of Crows. It might be in the last chapter of Piece of Crows. I forget. This yeah. is, like, at the very end, it's like, oh, 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 yeah, 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 the Game of Thrones. It's an actual game, and it, in a really meaningful way, shows you the differences in character between, like, Tyrion and... And uh, you, this princess from Dorne and a bunch of other contrasts. And Tyrion and the Sellswords, they play the game and stuff. Oh, it's it's super meaningful, but it's not in it's not in book one. Right. Oh, how about the whole prehistory that that is in the third Duncan Ed's Egg story of the blacks versus the reds, this civil war mm. that in many ways set the stage and set up the whole subplot with Aegon and uh, what Varys and Illyrio Mopatis are playing. What? Not there. Like, there's so much that's missing that should be there in Volume 1, as it's never in a Game of Thrones. And there's so much crap there that is meaningless and is going nowhere and means nothing. Okay? And, and, I want to say this straight up to your face, Internet. I'm saying this to your face, Internet. <laughs> volume 1 is badly written. Okay? Why? Definition of bad writing. When things happen... So the plot can progress, and for no other reason. Okay? Uh, we're going to do the great ranging at the wall. We're going to round up a bunch of guys and march. Why? Um, so, so the plot can progress. How are we going to win? Um, okay, so now we're at Crasser's Keep. 
So you, you don't have an army. This is a contingent, the Great Ranger. The whole of the Night's Watch is massively undermanned. They don't have enough men to lose anybody. They shouldn't be risking anyone's life. They stop at Craster's Keep. Craster and the old bear, Craster and the, the Lord Commander of the Night Watch, they sit down. They, they Let's break it down. There are a million wildlings. There is the largest army of human beings the North has ever known has been amassed by a Mance Raider. Mm -hmm. If you bump into them, every single one of you will die. Oh yeah, you know what else is going on? The others and this army of ice zombies. That's also up here. If you bump into them, every single one of you will die. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's keep going north. Yeah. <laughs> Why? What are you trying to accomplish? I don't know. You're not there's nothing there for you to conquer. It's not like you're trying to occupy and conquer a foreign city. There is no objective. There is nothing. It's not even like you're inviting Mance Raider to negotiate a peace treaty. There was absolutely nothing that That's could be true. gained. And all of you are going to die. And you've confirmed that explicitly in the meeting and discussion at Crash Cube. Why are you going to keep going? Well, well, there's a there's an author and there's a plot. Because this isn't... <laughs> it's garbage writing. Okay? Okay, wait, wait, wait. But it gets worse. Mm. So, Corin Halfhand. Yeah. Comes back to the... Oh, see, she's read it recently. She remembers all these obscure names. I think most people will, Who? He's the guy who comes back to the wall. And as soon as he shows up... So he's just gotten back to the wall. It's like, oh, let's let's go ranging in the north and kill some random wildlings. And let's take Jon Snow with us. Why? Right. No reason? Oh, hey, you're Jon Snow. Hey, you're, you're related... Let's take this 14-year-old right, kid. Right, right, right. With no skills... Like, oh yeah, we're putting together a unit of like the hardest dudes in the Night's Walk. One of them has yeah. a name like Stone Snake. Like, yeah, me and the corn and half and Stone Snake and like whatever. The other guy's name is like, you know, Asp Eater or some crap. And it's I thought like, the one was oh, called yeah. Lord of Bones or is that? No, no. That's, that's the Wild Lengths. Okay, that's later. Lord on. of Bones another. But anyway, but it's like, oh yeah, yeah, we got these like hard men from the Night's Watch. We're going to go up and like rape and murder some random right. Wild Lengths because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, no moral comment. Um, so let's just have Jon Snow join us. Oh, well, he's like in the Stewards Guild. He's not a ranger and he's like here working for... And we're undermanned and we're supposed to be fighting the like and and... and. What, why do you want to... Plot. <laughs> the Lord Commander says to him directly, but if you if you do this, you're all going to die. Like you're just, you're just going to die. Oh, well, you know, nobody lives forever. Like that's the actual... There's, there's no objective. What are you going to accomplish? Going north. Nothing. You're all going to die. We need every man we can get. We're critically undermanned. We're in the middle of a war. And again, there's no strategy. It's not like there's a peace treaty coming with Mance. No, no. War on an unbelievable scale with both the largest army of humans and the unlimited army of zombies. Okay, bye, guy. Okay, John. Go join. Oh, yeah. I hope you meet Benjamin in your watery grave. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you'll bump into Uncle Benjamin on your way to your death. Like, it makes no sense. It's so stupid. It's so unbelievably dumb. That is bad writing. And there's there's no way you can, like, symbolically interpret it and be like, oh, well, uh, you know, telepathically, Blood Raven was manipulating them, or Jojen could see the future. No, it's just bad writing. So, and Volume 1 has a lot of that. Like, I don't even want to talk about Volume 1. I want to talk about the events of the more recent novels. Okay. Because Volume 1 yeah. is not that interesting. But Volume 1, if you actually go back and look at it with the level of scrutiny that you have for the later volumes, it is yeah. badly written. Well, I remember when I first started reading it, I was really impressed with the foreword or, like, the very first part. Yes, that's beautifully written. Yeah. yeah the prologue and to Volume 1. And when they right. find the wolves, the, the wolf pups, like, yep. I don't know, like, some, yep. some chapters, I think, were... Oh, sure. Sure. Like, no, no, sure, sure, sure. Looking at it in isolation, mm -hmm. I remember feeling... So the prologue, that's where we first see the others, uh, north of the wall. Yeah. And, you know, the quality of writing there, just the description of the trees, the trees with their icy fingers against mm. the sky. And I really felt it that as soon as we got to chapter one or two, the quality of writing went down. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> I see. Yeah, you can't do like a 3,000-page book and have that level of, of a quality of description on every page. It seems to be a but, pattern. Yeah. I've really liked the epilogues and prologues and yes, each of the books. Yes, that's right. There's a little more care with the language. Yeah, and it's usually yeah. like people that we don't know. You right. Know, it's right? Different. Right. I mean, George. so George was a short story writer, 
and most a novella writer. Yeah. And he wrote scripts for Hollywood. You know, number of pages in a script is not is not that long. Right. And you yeah, know, there's a he, certain he, beauty to short stories yes. like that. That's, well, I, I like, think I mean the, the, these novels they they really are like a series of short stories. I'm mean, sorry, mm-hmm. everyone said that, but I mean you know like so you have that epilogue or that prologue, and it kind of works as a short story unto itself. Yeah. And then you get linked together this series of somewhat disjointed. Uh, short stories, sure. Yeah, I mean, you guys can tell even this criticism. You can tell, like in many ways, I appreciate George and his writing, and I, and I love the books. But there is a lot of bad writing in it. For me, like a rage quit moment. I'm forgetting if this was the first time I went through the books or the second, but because I, I think I'm remembering it from like the second or third time. Uh, so not all of it have I read three times, but the the later books, Feast Dance, I've definitely done three times. But I remember when Sam gets to Old Town. When Sam arrives in Old Town, it's like, oh my god. So we have, as readers, we have no interest in Old Town. It is just another town on the map. It's not like, oh great, with all this foreshadowing, I'm really interested to have a detailed description of Old Town. And it's like, toward the end of a $3,000 million, it's like, okay guys, I'm now going to explain to you what the market looks like and what the bridge looks like and the cobblestones <laughs> yeah. and the architecture. And you're going to get a guided tour. And there's this tower and there's some history behind the tower. It's like, my dude, if this was in volume one within the first 200 pages of volume one, okay. Like, we all signed up for that. Like, if you start a new novel, you start a new story, the first, let's see, I don't even remember the first description of King's Landing. Probably mm-hmm. was like that. When the Stark family arrives in Stick King's Landing and it smells bad and whatever. Okay, fine. The first description of Winterfell, fine. But like, dude, you are so many volumes into this. And there's nothing interesting about it. The description of Old Town is an old town. There is absolutely nothing interesting about the description of Old Town. As Sam is on his way to the Citadel. Nothing. Yeah, it's a little much. But, you know, this is... Coming from somebody who has read all of the Lord of the Rings books, yeah. and that, that was a, another level of okay. description and just too much. <laughs> so you, do you feel you accept that? Because I know, if for me, if the description serves no purpose, yeah, I know. know I felt I'm that way. Down for I'm sorry, it. I'm just not remembering where she is right now. But wherever Arya is in the yeah. in the story right now, like she well, she Bravos, arrived. I assume. Bravos, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, when she arrived, there were, I felt like there were like just wait. Right. The description was too much, you know. I mean, it could have been condensed into maybe one page right. or two pages, but I don't know. It 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 was a little much. I know I know he's introducing a new place, but uh Yeah, but yeah. why? I mean, that's that's ultimately the question. Like what? You know, I mean, in terms of the original plan of the books, we got a lot of description of the horse lords, the Dothraki, and their society. Yes. And it's clear the original plan of the books was, okay, we get this foreshadowing set up, we learn about their society, and then a large part of the book is going to be them arriving in Westeros mm-hmm. and overrunning Westeros and how everything changes. Yeah. When Westeros is conquered by a bunch of horse-riding barbarians. Is that what the books are about anymore? Like, is that, is that still going to happen? You know, maybe, you know, maybe Daenerys comes over. But it now seems like this minor thing. Now it's like, oh, no, no, we have all this description of the Iron Islands. And the Iron Islands and, like, the religious themes attached to uh, Euron Greyjoy, who wasn't even a character in, like, the first three books or something. Like, you know, he was just yeah. one more branch in a family tree. Like, oh, no, no, this is what's really important is, like, the religion of the Iron Islands. Like, you know, okay, is that the major, like, symbolic, political, and moral conflict or not? You know, yeah, I think you told me that it has the world record for number of characters. Yes, the whole right. series, and that yep. I don't really accept. That and most of the time when I'm reading about the descriptions of the horse, like the horses, but the, right. the families, like I just I just tune out. You know, like I try to read what information is relevant, but then it's like you know I don't need to know the whole family tree for every single character. Yeah. Um. Okay, l- look, I mean... <sighs> I, I, like, I appreciate the imaginativeness, the creativity. Uh, but yeah, like you say, if it's not for a purpose or if it's not... I don't know, do you think it has more of a point? Like, the, the descriptions of the family names and how people are related? And... 
I mean, I think that's part of what makes these discussions so difficult is that we ultimately don't know where it's going. So you mentioned Bravos, the description of society in Bravos. That's not the last Eastern society we get descriptions of. Um, and these Eastern societies are obviously isolated from the plot in, in Wessos, you know. Um, I thought the reason why we were learning so much about Bravosi society, and then as Tyrion escapes through Essos, we learn about several other societies, was because of the significance of elections. Was that we were given a kind of real world introduction to democracy, so that democracy doesn't seem like some perfect ideal. I mean, of course, if you really understand ancient Athens, ancient Athens was not perfect. But so that we have in contrast to feudalism, mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, so there are these other societies. And at first we just saw them in terms of slavery and that slavery is worse than freedom, right? Which, you know, obviously this is also true of ancient ancient Rome and, and ancient Athens. Okay, so slavery is a big deal. But then as the books progress bit by bit, we find, okay, these people don't have a king. They don't have lords and so on. They have elections. And this changes the whole society. Now, maybe that's meaningful and maybe it's not because we don't know where it's going yet. So, you know, it's perfectly in character, but I mean, um, uh, Tyrion doesn't get it. The actual scenes where Tyrion is discussing democracy. So I think they're in Volantis, but they're on, on the road going east. It doesn't matter. Um, it's just like, oh, ho, 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 this is delightful. Like, oh, yeah, I, you know, look at these elections. Isn't this charming? You know, but I mean, Tyrion is just scoffing at it and laughing at this. As opposed to having a society where, on the one hand, you have people like Jamie Lannister in power because they're really good at killing people. Jamie Lannister and Robert Baratheon both. So the handsome, physically massive, murderous aristocrat and people like you, Tyrion, people who just have a name, mm -hmm. who just have a claim to a bloodline and have no other redeeming qualities and are worthless in battle. You know what I mean? No offense. Yeah. You know, you're not going to win any sword fights here, Tyrion. But because you're related to someone who once was good in a battle or something, you know, and you and you push the peasants around. So, I mean, you know, that's that's something that could be meaningful uh, as as the books progress. You know, um, George is also doing this thing that really reflects his background in, in games. So partly video games, but especially tabletop board games, which he's admitted. He's does, done interviews about that. Role-playing games, but re real real life role-playing games. Role-playing games not on, on computers, where it's like he's just kind of filling in the whole world with details to balance out like the game, where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then, so these people have fire magic. So then these other people have water magic, and then these people have this other kind of magic, and oh yeah, yeah, like oh, each of the kingdoms on the map of the Seven Kingdoms mm -hmm. gets gets filled in. That stuff to me seems really meaningless and really aimless, and why are you asking the the reader to, to care about this? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I don't have any experience with Dungeons and Dragons, but it kind of right. seems like that. It's like, right. Yeah. So like this? Yeah, like, I right. don't know, all the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that everyone has a, every house has a sigil, and you're supposed to be right. vaguely aware of what each house's sigil is as you're reading. And <laughs> what's the point? I mean, so yeah, look, I mean, we, other than knowing, we like, know this. It's, it, even if nobody admits, it's, it's obvious from a careful reading of the books. When the books started being written, he did not have the idea of who was behind the weirwoods. Mm. So you know, when Bran gets to the north, eventually, mm. there's the magic man and the tree. And the magic man in the tree is the same guy who appears for five minutes in the Duncan Egg novels, by the way. The guy at the end, uh, Brendan Rivers of A Thousand Eyes and One. So it's the ancient, which again, is not that interesting. I'm sorry, it's not that big a reveal. <laughs> the, the minor character you might remember from uh, the prequel to Volume 1 now shows up uh, living in the sub-basement of, of an ancient temple in the, the north beyond the wall. And we got one line, which is very obvious it's before we thought of that. There's one line um, from the, the elderly maester at the wall that when he came north, Brennan Rivers came with him. You know, so that's that's it. That's all the foreshadowing you get. Um, we have a, a vision in the flames from Melisandre, which establishes that her enemy, the enemy of her religion, what she's against 
is Brendan Rivers, is the, the man in the tree. Mm. So, I mean, this is another problem. I haven't gotten to this yet. Right, okay, but you still... Taking your word for it. Look, in terms of, like, what is the point of the religion of R'hllor? These books were written at a time when America's war in Iraq and Afghanistan was a big deal. George R. R. Martin, his personal history goes back to the Vietnam War. Everyone knows this. But obviously, Islam is a big deal. And the religion of R'hllor enters the books originally. The first significance we get is that they burn statues... They burn idols. It's iconoclastic, yeah. which is like Islam. And they burn people. You know, they mm-hmm. burn witches at the stake and so on, right? So that's the initial, you know, significance of this. And then it's shifted. So who is, you know, who is the great other, other or what is it fighting against? Well, originally, we had the contrast between the kind of Catholicism of the religion of the seven and the Islam of you know, the religion of R'hllor. Yeah. And maybe that meant something, and maybe that mattered, maybe that was going one direction, because George R. R. Martin is extremely uh, harsh critic of religion. If you don't believe me, read the different Thousand Worlds stories. I've done YouTube videos on them in the past. But, like, at this point, I, I, you know, all of that has really become pretty pointless and aimless, you know, in, in my opinion. So... So so what, there are dueling magicians now? Like, it's just like, oh, Melisandre is working for some, you know, somebody in a robe behind a, you know, behind a curtain, like the Wizard of Oz. Somewhere <laughs> there's the Wizard of Oz who's at war with the other Wizard of Oz who's, you know, behind the trees. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's dumb. I mean, it's, I, I feel that's bad writing. And I think it reflects the fact that when the books were started, he re- none of this stuff. He didn't really have a structure. He didn't really have a plan. Um, and I th- the next book is taking so long to write, you know, uh, you know, largely for those for those reasons, right? Oh, hey, look, 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 look. Wait, what about because he's trying to connect all these dots? All yeah, these even look even Cersei's, Cersei's character, right? Mm. Even Cersei having this memory of her childhood. Yeah dream that still haunts her going to see the fortune teller right that that enters a little bit late guys i mean the big reveal yeah. for that that's a few like, that's a few novels late it was beginning of this that's right book. That's yeah. a, so that's in feast for crows yeah yeah it's like oh yeah right by the way guys i have a motivation that explains my behavior up to this point and in the future really yeah really though it's it's not about okay so so how does that explain that you responded to the death of your husband whom you hated by trying to seduce Ned Stark. Like, in terms of who she was, who she, there was no plan. There was no thought put into this. Like, oh, no, no. Her situation is that she's motivated by this, you know, you know, this this childhood experience she had that, experience. that shaped her. Yeah, I think yeah. I think that would be a different novel, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, and look, I like, I mean, I, I, I basically am someone who thinks the books got better as they progressed and more interesting. And I like the writing from Cersei's perspective in, in the later books and so on. Yeah. I think it raises a lot of interesting interesting questions. And again, she's a mean, middle-aged person, you know, thinking about politics. Um, but yeah, you know, so you may not know this, babe. My girlfriend may not know this. One of the other notorious things is that George had planned, and this isn't just at the beginning, right up to the last minute, right up to Feast for Crows, Dance with Dragons, his plan was to have the plot stop and then to have a five-year gap and then continue the plot five years later. So one of the chapters from The Winds of Winter, which isn't published yet, but there are individual chapters that have been posted by the author publicly, Mm -hmm. um, it has Arya having quite an active sex life. So she's supposed to be five years older, right? So she was supposed to go from like 14 to 19 mm-hmm. in the five years gap. And then that never happened, right? And Jon Snow is like maybe 16 or something in his position of political power. Yeah. Again, if there was a five-year gap or if there were five years that passed during which time the Night's Watch were getting more and more pissed off with his leadership before he's assassinated or something... Like, it's, it's hard to say where exactly in each of those storylines the five-year gap would have been. Maybe the five-year gap was supposed to be after John's assassin, like he stays dead for five years. Mm-hmm. But this is another... I'm sorry, it's just bad writing, you know, removing, uh, removing the five-year gap. And then all the characters are too young for what had been sketched out in the plot. I'm sorry, the whole emergence of Dorne 
the whole emergence of Dorne of the South into the plot. Which is in the book that I'm reading. Right, now. right. And so like, you, oh, don't oh, get, oh, you don't right. get any perspective from Dorne until right. this fourth right. book. Right, and not, and, and also, it's supposed to be so important. Right. And, and also not even in the Duncan Egg novels, by the way. Like, you don't get any sense Dorne is an important place or, mm. you know, or is part of the political situation. You know, oh, oh, right, there's this other place called Dorne. I'm sorry, but the emergence of both Dorne and the Iron Islands in the later books... It's uh, it's bad writing. Yeah. And like all of a sudden, oh yeah 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 yeah. Um, there's this princess, and she also has really big breasts. And you're supposed to care <laughs> a lot about her storyline. All of a sudden, even though like her only defining character traits are that she's really shallow and really stubborn and really short sighted and really self. She's a selfish, dumb biot. She has no. Yeah. There's nothing interesting about she. And none of these people have any motivation. I mean, sorry, any any interesting motivation? Yeah. Something that we've talked about together is that, you know, I like in this book, A Feast for Crows, that you're now getting the perspective of uh, poor people or yes, just people right. who are not in positions of power. Right. And you know, you mentioned that that's partly why Duncan I guess interesting to you these these uh, short short novellas or whatever. Um, As opposed to just the perspective of the most elite aristocrats in the society. Yeah, I think one way that he could have, I mean, one way that he could have written it differently is focus on these same characters in the same locations, don't introduce more places. Yeah. Just try to stick to the characters that we already know within the first three books and maybe look at different perspectives right. in, in future books rather than, like, yeah, we're, we're getting to know Dorne now through the perspective of both the right. you know people in charge and uh, and uh, the the people right. who are not in charge, but you know we why do we care about Dorne? I mean we've been reading for so I many know. pages already. Like, I know. Why should we care about Dorne? And what what's happening with Dothraki? What's if happening Dorne with... has managed to be so insignificant to the political situation up until now, they can yeah. keep on being <laughs> right. And yeah. I, like I personally really like the chapters with the wall and with John Snow. Right. I'd like, I wish we would have more perspective up there, too, and not, not just John, you know, a little bit of Sam. But Sam is right, you know, right, going right, to right, Old right, Town, right, right. which is another plot right. device. Which <laughs> all like, of a sudden, what are we going to do with this? And the, believe me, when you get to Old Town, there are like 20 more named characters I'm in sure. Old Town who yeah. all matter, who all are important oh, in their yeah. own way. I mean, that's, that's the way that it seems to be going. And I don't know, like, as a writer, you have right. to be thinking about how can you write okay. this up? How, how are you ever going to wrap this up? Or is this just so going to be something that's this, infinite? This discussion is totally about the books and not about the TV show. But there's a parallel challenge for writers, which is the art of omission. So, like, you know, there are large parts of this story that could be omitted and could be more powerful for that reason. So, you would know this at least from the TV show. Uh, the TV show did a terrible job with this. But Tyrion murders his own father, and then he goes a little bit crazy, or he has, this has a big emotional impact on him and his relationship with various prostitutes. It's all kind of crashing down on him, okay? You know what? You don't need to see that. It could be way more powerful if Tyrion murders his father, and then he re-enters the plot years later, and you just see how he's changed. And you just, you know, it could be in there in two sentences and not from his perspective. It's like, yeah, I used to be an aristocrat and now I'm like this wandering, you know, revenant. This is what's left of me. Like mm -hmm. where it just shattered him. Where he's just, you know, he's he is devastated. And you see that devastation. But no, like George's way of writing that is like, here's Tyrion getting drunk again. Here's Tyrion being self-pitying again. Mm -hmm. Here's Tyrion going to another brothel and sleeping with another prostitute and another one again. And it's, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but that too is bad writing. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the bad writing that the, that's the easiest to ignore because people do care about Tyrion. They already have enough invested in him. But does no, he change? I mean, like that, in the that books, that really does, could does be he change omitted, after this? Omitted. What he goes through? I mean, because, yeah, and one of the issues that I... Is, with a, that a writer always I has think, to think about. I think about. that's a really good question, Joe. Sorry, but you keep you keep on. But does do any of the characters change as much as they should? Go right. Ahead. That's what I was just going to yeah. say. That's one of the issues with with writing that you need to actually have character development. Right. Or otherwise, right, right, like, right. what is the point of right. reading about these static characters that are right. you know uh, not making any changes? Not and anyway. Right. So yeah. No, like, I, know, I don't. So I, I've mentioned this to my girlfriend before. I read a book when I was a child. Some of you will guess what this book was. It's a famous book. I'm, I'm not going to name it. I read a book when I was a child, and it's a mainstream corporate crap paperback book that a lot of children read. And in that book, up until almost exactly the halfway mark, the main character, he's motivated by revenge, 
and it hits the halfway mark, and he's like, yes, you know, the time is coming. One day, he's going to get revenge against the people who killed his parents, the people who destroyed the village he came from. Mm-hmm. His village was destroyed with something, something like that. And then there's, like, you know, a couple of blank pages, then it's part two, and it's maybe just five years later. Yeah, there's something like a five-year gap, but he's grown up. He doesn't care at all. <laughs> it's, it's never there at all. And for me as a kid, that that really struck me. It was like, whoa, people change. Like when you, can he, he was really young. So let's say like when you were 13 years old, you thought the most important thing on earth was getting revenge because yeah. your village got burnt down. And now you're 23 and you're an experienced warrior and you know a lot of people's villages have been burnt down. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are orphans. You've met you know, and you just moved on and you have no interest in revenge on anyone and you've got a totally different perspective. And that, I mean, again, it was a dumb corporate kids book it's not a masterpiece it's not considered great literature Mm -hmm. but i remember as a kid it was like whoa so yeah i mean seeing that kind of character change it's obviously something we were looking for in the tv show even with somebody like john john snow yeah again that his plot has gone further in the tv show than the books it's like nope dying and coming back from the dead just doesn't change you going going from being a down on your luck bastard who doesn't even think he's going to survive the next few months you know, at the wall in this crazy, hopeless war, badly written war <laughs> against the wildlings, <laughs> yeah. to being in a position of tremendous power, to, you know, being backstabbed, betrayed by your friends and colleagues, and, you know, no, just same old, same old John, you know, nothing's, nothing's really changed there. So, yeah, the, um, the, the question of whether or not we get the character development we, we should be getting, and I would guess the problem in the book is the five-year gap. I mean, how does Arya learn to speak Bravosi? How does she change so much as soon as she gets off the boat? Well, I think there were supposed to be five years that passed in there, and maybe something a little bit more, a little bit more interesting. And look, I mean, maybe is this? I see. I don't know how you feel about these chapters, or how, or how many have you done? Um, does Jamie Lannister change enough? Is he our positive example, or is he, or is it, or is it the same problem? I mean. We, we really only get to know Jamie after he's had his hand cut off. Right. We don't really get to we know him. Know so we get like. to know him later when he's... Yeah, we, we get to see him after he's made, right. presumably made a, you know, a big change in right. his personality. Right, where he's taking on the new direction and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think so. Yeah. I So I really, really love those chapters, the Jamie chapters on the first reading. Yeah. Um, I, like, I like Jamie's chapters. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, in the original plot for the books, which, again, has been leaked, so we know what the original plot was, he was basically just the villain. He was just the scenery-chomping evil villain. He was the Darth Vader Hmm. of the story. Yeah, and so, I mean, part of what's going on there is just George spontaneously adapting and changing. Like, for George, that's what's interesting about it. It was like, okay, I started writing this guy as a villain, and now here I am kind of unpacking different layers of him and finding things that are... Things that are redeeming or interesting or conflicted about him. Yeah, you know? I also like. I feel like the character development of Sansa, at least at the point that I'm reading, yes, is pretty sure. poor. Just because what she's, you know, what she's been through and gets you, worse. You think she'd be more jaded or you know rebellious in nature by this point? Uh, I mean, look. Okay, so you know what? I thought about mentioning this earlier, and I, I wasn't going to just because it's it's past what you've read. Because so there were the finished books, and then there were the leaked chapters for Winds of Winter. But you already know this from the TV show and Broad Brush Drogues. Mm-hmm. Sansa is abducted by Littlefinger, right? Yeah. And both of their motivations don't make sense after that point. Yeah. L- little, if Littlefinger literally raped her or married her or imprisoned her or used her in a plot to take over political power in the North, that could make sense. There are kind of a million possibilities. Littlefinger literally owns a brothel multiple brothels. He literally tortures people to death mercilessly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Littlefinger is this incredibly evil, vindictive character. And the only soft spot he had is a sexual obsession with Sansa's mother, who's now deceased, that he transferred to Sansa. And he started being sexually obsessed with Sansa from the minute he first met her. So in terms of motivation, in every way, and now he's captured her. In, in almost impossible circumstances, he snatches yeah. Sansa out of thing. And now, it, it would make sense if she were literally in chains, mm-hmm. or if he were, you know, being kingmaker, queenmaker, 
carrying out some plot with her or something. What he actually does with her in both book and show makes no sense. Yeah. And her relationship to him also, in my opinion, uh, makes no sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you even just think about the very first step, if you're Littlefinger, once you've captured Sansa, why would you take her to the veil vale and reunite her with her aunt? Even that does not make sense. Well, I mean, the point would be to take over the veil, which he did. In the books, at least. I don't know. Right. I don't remember okay. the show. But... Okay. Okay, but you see, no, that's wait. bad writing. No, that's bad writing. But he's not. No, no, wait, 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 wait. That's bad writing. There's no way he could be planning to murder his wife. Well, you know, that's a totally spontaneous, ridiculous situation. There's no way he can be planning to murder his wife within like two days of getting married, within a couple of days of getting married, and to carry out the ridiculous, spontaneous plot that happens to take over the veil. There's no way that can be his plan at that point. And even if he was going to go back to cement the marriage to her and, you know, gain some kind of status in the veil, um, by bringing Sansa there, you know, he's put he's putting her into the clutches of a crazy woman yeah. who knows who she really is and who has power over him and power over Sansa and who can That's prevent true. him from marrying or having sex with Sansa, who can destroy all of his plans, all of his short-term and long-term plans. Yeah. And again, he's he's a brothel keeper. There are other things. Jane Poole, a minor character, is, you know, raped and brutalized and turned into a prostitute and then later sold to Ramsay Bolton as Ramsay Bolton's bride the Jane Poole subplot. But, I mean, in every way, this is this ruthless, cold guy. I mean, even if even if he kept Sansa locked up uh, somewhere else when he went to the Vale, that would make... So everything... Why why do the different steps happen? The plot. That's absolutely, you know, all there is to it yeah. with, uh, with him. And, I mean, there... You know, if what he wants is what he wanted in book one, it's, you know, it's not even really clear why he'd go to the Vale at all. He could do almost yeah. anything, yeah. you know, at that stage. Um, yeah, so I, I just see to me that's that's bad writing on the big strategic level, and then also I mean, who is Sansa and how does she feel about Littlefinger and what does she want and what's what's her situation? That does not make a whole lot of sense either. You know, um, you could mm-hmm. write Sansa as just a weeping basket case, yeah. like just make her someone who's just totally overwhelmed by these situations. But like, oh, sorry, like five minutes ago you were married to the king. Well, going to be married to the king, and then that was canceled. And finally, you were married to the wealthiest man in Westeros, yeah. Tyrion Lannister, and like you know, I mean, he's a dwarf, but he's still being you know being married to a multimillionaire in our in our times, and so you know, I mean, there are all these you know vicissitudes she goes through, mm. and uh, yeah, what happens next with her doesn't make a lot of sense strategically yeah. or in terms of of character analysis. No. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just that brings to mind so many different things in the plot, like yeah, that haven't been resolved. I mean, maybe maybe they have right. later on, like you know, who, who killed who yet. killed Joffrey, you know, like right. So and, look, I, like, that was open. Maybe how did he know? Like, how right. did Littlefinger know to be there when? Okay, yes, well, no, right. We, we do know because of his. Okay, well, if the, if the you joke, think the, if you think Littlefinger planned it, if you think he conspired to plan it, then he yeah. knew when to be there because he's right. guilty because right. he's implicated in it. Right. So, but I mean, same with that's the conclusion most people come to with the plot to kill Bran. But then it seems is like that Littlefinger must have been responsible for it because otherwise nothing makes sense. Yeah. And the other explanation is it's just really badly written. <laughs> so you know that if Littlefinger didn't orchestrate that, you know. Yeah, it also seems too convenient to pl- to put all these major plot points on Littlefinger like this is his fault. That's right. All these situations. Everything becomes <laughs> He's Littlefinger's just fault. Ultimate evil, you know. Everything like, that's becomes not very Littlefinger's realistic. fault because he compensates for bad writing. Okay, so look, that you know who's a parallel of that is is Ramsey Bolton. All right, sorry, this is another straight up bad writing thing. So sorry, sorry, but you know Littlefinger, like one of the reveals is oh the letter written from Lysa to Catelyn to start the war was because of Littlefinger mm. because it's in Littlefinger's interest to start this war. No, it's just bad writing. It's like, oh yeah, Littlefinger was was plotting that. Though. Okay, that makes sense because otherwise nothing makes sense. All right, moving on. <laughs> Ramsey Bolton, telepathic mastermind. Ramsey Bolton is like, oh, by the way, I have this disguise here ready to go. Like he meets Theon. Like, oh, my name is Reek. I have this other identity. Later on, no, it's not. I'm secretly Ramsey Bolton. Yeah. Oh, I've got this plan. We'll murder these two boys on the farm and do this thing. Like, 
Yeah. There's this series of plot points there where it's like if Ramsey Bolton is not telepathic, is yeah. can see the future, super <laughs> genius, nothing he's doing makes sense. And that continues, yeah. right? It continues <laughs> not making sense, Ramsey Bolton's plot. Mm. So there are people who read the books like, oh, yeah, no, it's like Ramsey is, cert- is like secretly a green seer. Like he can see the future. It's like, no, oh. it's just bad writing. Hmm. I think step by step, everything that happened with Ramsey is, is badly written. And it's just like, oh, George is an award winning, well, award winning horror writer. And that had to come out at some point. So, you know, to me, that seems totally, you know, improvised. The point where Reek goes away to get help, and then Reek comes back with an army because he was secretly yeah. Ramsey Bolton the whole time. It's like <laughs> nothing about this made no, sense up to totally this point. A and, remember, and also, you know, the, the, the TV show uh, does a good job with that, where you know um, Arya disguises herself as a commoner, but Tyrion can tell she's not really. He says, you know, you don't yeah. talk like a commoner. Right. Like okay, so Ramsey Bolton. Raised by the second most powerful and wealthy house in the north, blah, blah, blah. We know his whole background. But, oh, yeah, nobody can guess that you're not, you know, reek. You know, and, and nobody else around acts like this is weird or whatever. Like, it's it's just bad writing. So, yeah. Okay, there you go. I mean, look, guys, the if you look at them uh, as a whole... The A Song of Ice and Fire books are a flawed masterpiece. I think they're called a masterpiece for a reason, but they are a, a badly flawed masterpiece. And nobody wants to go back and fix the errors in them more than George R. R. Martin himself. I think he knows that, and I think, he, I think he's really burdened by that. And I think that's part of why the Duncan Egg novels are being written, is so that the novels can start with something that's written where he's already aware of the ending, including like, oh yeah, there's the Blackfire Rebellion and the War of the Six Penny Kings and all this other stuff about the political situation and what was going on in King's Landing a hundred years before the plot started, you know, like what, you know, all this stuff he made up later that that isn't there in the first two or even three books or whatever to go back and and rewrite the beginning, the genesis of of the plot action. All right, well, anyone who's watched the TV show Whose Line Is It Anyway will get... This (laughs) This oh, yeah. <laughs> Game of Thrones is like the book where everything's made up and the points don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying about it. But I'm going to continue reading it, I presume. Yeah. I mean, I'm right. only on the fourth book and I still have a lot to go. Well, if you guys ever take the time to read George R. R. Martin's Thousand World books, what he's really strong on is sentiment, is writing a story around a sentiment, around like just a feeling is mm. what the story's supposed to evoke. And, you know, he, he really was kind of an early proponent of idea-driven short storytelling. And really, the only ones I can remember that were any good, they were basically just anti-religion. Uh, stuff like Seven Times Never Kill a Man, A Song for Laia, where it was critique of, of religion. And, you know, he really challenged himself with this. I feel that these books are, in many ways, a response to the malaise of American imperialism in his lifetime, in the last 20, 30 years. That American democracy has lost its appeal. American, the American empire, the endless wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and his own memories of the Vietnam War and stuff. And it's obviously it's not that he's against democracy, don't get me wrong, but I think he's wrestling with, you know, a lot of these questions. And it, it, I think it evokes those sentiments powerfully. You know, a lot of this stuff. And there is other stuff there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here about being fat. There's a lot of stuff about wrestling with your own sexuality. Even Jamie Lannister dealing with his own celibacy and stuff. Mm-hmm. There are other there are other themes. There are things that come up. And they work as kind of isolated sentiments, story by story, yeah. as the books progress. Yeah. Uh, but there is a lot wrong with it. Mm-hmm. And I think exactly his trick of having a last minute fix written in yes. like oh it was little finger all along oh uh, it was varies all along varies all <laughs> along his motivation was to plot uh, a restoration of the blackfire dynasty the blackfire dynasty hadn't even been thought of during the writing of the first three books like oh yeah yeah we've, we've added this in so varies has a has a motive no sorry but do you guys remember back in book one and, and even the first couple seasons of the tv show varies's motivation was supposed to be that he was passionately opposed to black magic 
or opposed to magic in general. Yeah, that was the original because of father. what happened to him. Right, I mean, but also that's... His whole right. storyline. Stannis represented about. magic, and his reason for opposing Stannis was that Stannis mm-hmm. would bring bring back magic and yeah. religious fundamentalism. So that was interesting, was Varys representing secularism and science, right. and Stannis representing magic and, frankly, Islam. Okay, that's a conflict. Now what does Varys represent? No, Seven I, haven't books him, oh. so I haven't seen him in forever. In okay, book. so you you have a guy. Oh oh oh. Um, yeah. Well, there was this war like uh, decades and decades ago, and there's this other line of House Targaryen called the Blackfires, and there's this secret plot, and and that'll work out better because yeah, because reasons, and he was secretly planning it all. Along. It's lame. <laughs> All right, look, George uh, is at this point the highest paying, uh, sorry, the highest paid non-productive author in the world. (laughs) He's being given millions of dollars to write this book, The Winds of Winter, that he, (laughs) to say he's behind schedule is is an understatement. And we will see. It's, It's, you know, a compliment to the guy to say that he has big shoes to fill because he created those shoes himself. The shoes from the fill that he he created himself. Mm Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I think a lot of us, having now read these books two and three times or whatever, I think a lot of us, our expectations are low. Our ex- I think a lot of us are expecting to be disappointed. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the TV show has disappointed us all. What's going to happen when Jon Snow gets up off that stone slab, you know, and is resurrected? I don't think he has anything meaningful to tell us. Mm-hmm. I don't think Varys has anything meaningful to tell us. I think the philosophy of Varys and Littlefinger and Jon Snow has already been exhausted in these novels. And uh, it's what, what do you think something really fascinating and brilliant and insightful is coming from Dorne? I don't. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm still reading. I'm still hoping. I'm still listening to podcasts talking about this stuff. It's been a very evocative, very inspiring series of novels for me. Yeah. But sadly, there's just enough bad writing that... <laughs> <laughs> that in terms of what I expect to come next, my expectations are low. Bye.